Recovery pathways um, is what I'm going to talk about, broadly speaking, this morning. As Tom mentioned, this is the Recovery Research Institute uh, that I founded a few years ago. Um, you can sign up. We, we publish a free monthly bulletin through uh, recoveryanswers.org. You can sign up and get that for free uh, if you'd like. So in terms of an outline, um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of hit three points. What is recovery? How prevalent is it in the, in the United States? I'm going to talk about the rationale for recovery support services. So this is kind of what happens after acute care treatment for substance use disorder. And I'll talk about what do we know scientifically from a research standpoint on these recovery support services. So what is recovery? The recovery um, movement has really taken off um, culturally in the United States and around the world in the last 10 or 15 years. You may have heard of Faces and Voices of Recovery, the Unite to Face Addiction Rally held on the Mall um, last year uh, in, in 2015 um, uh, to, uh, to kind of galvanize and, 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 and increase the profile of the need to address these endemic public health problems related to substance use disorder. And uh, the Surgeon General's report, of course, came out in November last year. I was honored to, per, to uh, write one of the chapters, along with my colleague uh, Keith Humphreys on recovery in that report. Um, but it, it was emphasizing the need to focus on, uh, on recovery. So what is recovery from substance use disorder? Well, broadly speaking, of course, it really remains kind of getting into remission or abstinence or uh, other people have argued that it's more than just abstinence but rather um, it's a, a, a kind of a self-actualization process where people are not just kind of gaining back their health but really um, getting more than that, uh, kind of contributing to the community uh, in addition to gaining remission. And these are some, uh, some definitions. There are many other definitions of recovery, but most people think about, and you may have your own definition of what recovery is, uh, and, uh, but most people think of recovery as something beyond just abstinence, so it's something that is gained uh, beyond just abstinence. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you right now, um, these are brand new data from a national study that we've just conducted uh, with the, uh, the, national, uh, the Recovery Research Institute. Um, never before seen, I haven't even seen these, these results, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna show you, okay? So that's how new they are. Um, so I'm gonna be as surprised as you are. So uh, this is just, a, we just completed this national study on 39,000 random sample um, of 39,000 uh, uh, US uh, adults, 18 years and older. Um, and um, we asked them, did you once have a problem with alcohol or drugs but no longer do? And that was the STEM question. We got a response rate of 63%. That's in line with all other national epidemiological surveys, so that was uh, good news. And what did we find? We found that uh, in the U.S. population, 9.1%, so this is based on a probability-based national uh, uh, sample. 22.35 million people have resolved, uh, successfully resolved a significant alcohol or other drug problem. Uh, as you can see here on the right, the majority of those are relating to alcohol. Of course, alcohol is the legal drug. That's the one that we see most substance use disorder associated with. Um, and then other ones, uh, also cannabis, cocaine, opioids, methamphetamine. And um, what's interesting when we look at the pathways, so it's like, what are the pathways of recovery? And this is what we found in this particular sample. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here, but I just wanna give you a kind of a little glimpse of what we found. Um, about half of the sample didn't use any kind of formal service at all. They didn't go to treatment, they didn't go to uh, AA, NA, didn't use any mutual help groups. Um, they just decided this was becoming a problem and were able to resolve that problem by themselves. The other half uh, needed some kind of, or chose to use some kind of other kind of assistance. So we call that assisted pathway. So about half and half. This is consistent with other studies which have shown that uh, um, uh, in other studies, smaller studies, with convenience samples that, that majority of people actually resolve a significant alcohol drug problem without formal assistance, but about half in this sample uh, resolve with formal assistance. The other thing that was interesting was of those who reported resolving a significant alcohol drug problem, about half were completely abstinent from everything. The other half were using some kind of substance, but not their primary substance. So three quarters of individuals who reported resolving a significant alcohol problem they reported abstinence from their problem substances, whatever they were, uh, which again is, is interesting. 
We do know from other studies that more stable remission is associated with abstinence. So again, this is cross-sectional, um, uh, but this is what we found cross-sectionally. And then the other thing that was interesting is what proportion of people actually identify as being in recovery? So we asked people, do you consider yourself to be in recovery of these individuals who have resolved a significant alcohol and drug problem? And about half, again, as you can see, said, yeah, I consider myself to be, quote, in recovery. So we're looking at, 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 um, at uh, those, those things in terms of identifying what are the predictors of being in those different categories and different pathways. So that's what we're looking at right now. We're probably going to publish that uh, very soon. Uh, as well as a slew of other findings from this uh, study. But when, when we ask about assistance, this is what uh, it looks like. Most people use, uh, the majority of people are using some kind of mutual help group, like AA or NA. Also others, but a, a smaller proportion, using other groups like Smart Recovery, Life Ring, Women for Sobriety. Um, and then uh, the next biggest thing was outpatient treatment, about 30% who'd used an assisted pathway. Um, a minority only had used um, medications and then other recovery support services like faith-based, church-based recovery support services, as well as recovery community centers, which are an, an emerging uh, enterprise. So just wanted to kind of give you a glimpse of that because we're just, we're just getting those data um, kind of... Um, out now and starting to look at them. So uh, we'll, we'll be publishing uh, several papers, uh, hopefully this year, uh, looking at quality of life, self-esteem, happiness related to these different pathways uh, and how, uh, what the predictors of those pathways are. So um, why recovery support services? Well, we know substance use disorder tends to be a chronic disease that uh, is susceptible to relapse over many years in clinical samples. And this highlights, this, this timeline highlights in clinical samples who tend to have the more severe complex forms of substance use disorder, the typical timeline on average from studies, prospective and retrospective studies. Roughly, it takes about four to five years after the onset of substance use disorder before people start to seek specialty treatment, some kind of assistance, four to five years. So that's a long time. During that time, people are trying to regulate, control their substance use uh, to, to varying degrees to prevent consequences. When they find that they cannot or someone else intervenes, um, they reach that specialty care point. What's also noteworthy is it takes about eight years on average to get one year of full sustained remission after people start seeking specialty care. The good news is most of those days are abstinent days. But people might get six months, have a relapse, might get nine months, have a relapse. But to get that one year of full sustained remission takes about eight years and about four to five treatment episodes on average. Also noteworthy from a chronic disease management or recovery management perspective is after people achieve one year of full sustained remission, it takes four to five years of sustained remission before the risk of relapse or reinstatement of substance use disorder in the following year drops below 15%. Why 15%? Because that is the risk in the general population for meeting substance use disorder criteria in any given year. So to be no more likely than anybody else out there in the general population of meeting substance use disorder in the following year takes four to five years of continuous remission for somebody who's already had the disorder. So what does that suggest? It suggests that people need not just 30 days or 60 days or 90 days of intervention, but rather they may need that, but in addition, they need some kind of ongoing recovery support service management and monitoring that can help sustain, intervene early if there is uh, risk. The good news is about 60%, um, anywhere from 44 to 66% in recent studies, clinical samples, uh, achieve full sustained remission. So it's actually, compared to many psychiatric disorders, this is a good prognosis disorder. These are national epidemiological survey data. You see the prevalence of remission for alcohol and other drug use disorders, again, consistent with other studies, about 50 to 60 percent. Now, we've learned a lot in terms of neuroscience findings in the last 25 years, right, through neuroimaging in particular. Uh, as well as neuropsychological findings. But we know addiction is a disease that affects the brain, the neurocircuits here of reward, memory, motivation, impulse control, and judgment. These are radically impaired in individuals with uh, the moderate severe forms of substance use disorder. We also know structurally, not just functionally, but structurally the brain is changed. You don't have to look very long or very hard to see here 
um, that the brain is structurally changed as a function of chronic exposure to neurotoxins, in this case, uh, alcohol. So we know that recovery uh, is a process that involves biological, psychological, and social challenges and changes. This model, uh, we're all very familiar with stress and the impact of stress today, right? Type A, type a personality, we've all heard of that. Uh, we understand that stress has a physiological effect. This was not always the case, right? Go back to the 1950s, Hans Seely was doing original work with, with animals to look at the impact of stress on, on organisms functioning and actually mortality. So he could actually stress animals to death just by using uh, different stresses. And he described this, this syndrome, this what he called the general adaptation syndrome, um, of alarm resistance and exhaustion. So he said when, when an animal got stressed, there was an alarm response, there was an activation of the biological system that tried to counteract that stress. There was a period of resistance, but then exhaustion. Okay? So as you can imagine, you can only hold on for so long before your, your body becomes exhausted. Now, if you think about this from an addiction recovery standpoint, what happens to people when they start to a recovery attempt? Usually there's an arrest, there's an intervention by a, a, a loved one or a spouse, that's it, I'm getting out of here, you've got to do something about this. So there's some kind of alarm event that triggers a recovery attempt. So what happens? I'm not going to do this again, I'm going to quit, this is it, this is the last time. I mean it. Right? And oftentimes people do really mean it. Okay? They mean what they say. Um, if you gave them a polygraph test, you would know they were telling the truth. But the problem is, is that they can only resist for so long before that human organism becomes exhausted without other kinds of inputs and supports. We know also that early uh, remission, so in these first weeks and months of recovery, when people are abstinence in this post-acute withdrawal phase of recovery, there is increased sensitivity to stress. There's increased uh, elevation in corticotropin releasing factors, cortisol, neuropeptide Y, other kinds of stress hormones are elevated early in recovery. People are hypersensitive sensitive to stress. They have difficulty sleeping, focusing, concentrating, as well as um, activity uh, levels. In terms of reward, there's a down-regulation of reward receptors, which makes people um, less sensitive to reward early in recovery. So you've got hypersensitivity to stress, less sensitivity to reward, this kind of hedonic deafness, this kind of deafness to, to pleasure, pleasure deafness, some people uh, describe it as. Um, and this is why when we think about recovery, this is why we need to provide support, especially early on in this first year. Um, and this has been termed recovery capital. Recovery capital comes from behavioral economic theory, uh, as you might guess, using the word capital. Capital is a resource that people can draw on to uh, support their recovery. This can be personal resources, it can be social resources, and it can be community uh, resources. It's a biciprical relationship. Here it's depicted as a bicyclical relationship between remission and recovery capital. So as people get into remission, they start to accrue recovery capital. Also, we can ex influence the chances of remission by providing more recovery capital. Now, why is that? Because if we provide more recovery capital, more resources for people, give them hope that they can recover and give them the means to do it, we can reduce that burden of biopsychosocial stress, which can increase the chances of remission. What about psychosocially? Now, we have lots of theories about um, psychosocial um, uh, um, factors which influence the onset of, of substance use disorder as well as treatment. We don't have very good theories about remission and recovery, long-term recovery, yet. But I think there's some parallels we can draw, and there are many theories that we can draw on that have helped explain onset of substance use that may explain offset. There are parallels between onset and offset. For example, um, the National Institute of Drug, Drug Abuse says there are four main reasons why people use drugs, to feel good, to feel better, to do better, performance enhancement, or because other people are doing it, right? What are the four main reasons why people stop using drugs? <laughs> feel good? <laughs> so ironically, paradoxically, right, what the, the reasons why people start are the reasons why people stop, okay? To feel good, to feel better, to do better, right? They find that they actually perform better when they're not intoxicated, and uh, because other people are doing it. Recovery can be contagious. 
So when we look across different theories, these are the four major theories which we turn to and look to to describe onset of substance use. Uh, but they can also be used to, to, to explain, help, us, help us explain the offset. These are social control theory, which is to do with monitoring supervision, um, so strong social bonds to pro-social uh, mores and activities, social cognitive learning theory, which has to do with expectancies and role modeling. Of course, when you see people using drugs, you might have an expectation that that's going to be a good thing, and people try it. Stress and coping, again, to feel better. People used to feel better because they're coping or with a stressful event internally or externally. And behavioral economic theory posits that people use because of a lack of alternative competing rewards, which are compelling enough to attract them. Um, and uh, what's interesting is when we look at these same factors in recovery, many of these same constructs are used, again, this parallel between onset and offset. Um, when you think about recovery support services, they provide ongoing monitoring, uh, management, supervision. They provide role models of recovering individuals who can serve to create expectancies, positive expectancies about recovery. They can help people learn uh, and cope with stresses uh, in their life on the road of life and the road of recovery and provide alternative competing reinforcers which can be used um, to, to help them. Now, I always throw in a few chairs. If I, th if I show a lot of tables, I, I have some chairs as well because I want people to be comfortable here today. So, uh, in fact, I'm, now I've learned, I'm just very suspicious now if people show tables without any chairs. Uh, so, just so you know, I'm, I'm, I was, um, so, just a couple. I don't want you to get too comfortable, but. So, um, when we think about uh, recovery support services and supporting recovery over time, we know that Addiction relapse tends to be precipitated by these three major factors, cues, stresses, and priming doses of the drug. So cues are people, places, and things which become strongly associated with substance use. Okay? And then re-exposure to those cues, people, places, and things can trigger uh, in in increased craving and increase the risk of relapse. Stresses. So use stress and distress, positive stresses and negative stresses, people find very difficult to cope with early in recovery. And then priming doses, having a little bit of alcohol or a little bit of cocaine or a little bit of marijuana can increase craving and increase the risk of relapse. So when we think about recovery support services and how they may work is that they need to offset these potential triggers uh, and uh, pathways into relapse. And they do so by altering the social structure of people's lives which can also alter the psychology, the, the neurocognition, and also the biological aspects. So what do we know um, from a scientific standpoint um, about recovery support services? There have uh, grown a number of recovery support services now. In the, really in the last 10 years, uh, a lot of these have grown. Um, some of them you, you're familiar with, like Alcoholics Anonymous, is probably the oldest in terms of mutual help organizations. These have been around since the 1930s, uh, and there's, a, there's now a lot more mutual help organizations. But there are also, stemming from the research on mutual help groups like AA, there has been a formalization of peer support in terms of peer support models, recovery coaches. You may have heard that term. That's catching on. It's in fashion. Uh, right now, recovery coaching and recovery coaches, uh, where I work, for example, we have 10 recovery coaches employed in our Massachusetts General Hospital that help patients, help link their, peer, their peers in recovery, help patients link to community resources. Um, sober living environments have been around halfway houses, sober homes. These have been around a long time. Now we've got science to support them. There are very few clinical models, actually, surprisingly, of long-term disease management and addiction. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. There are increasing recovery community centers growing all over the country. We're doing a big study funded by the NIH right now to look at uh, recovery community centers in New England and New York State. So we're looking at the clinical and public health utility of providing indigenous recovery support through these recovery community centers in, um, uh, in, in, in U.S. communities. Uh, also, there's been a growth in recovery supports in educational settings. So recovery high schools and collegiate recovery programs are growing up all over the country that can provide needed support 
uh, instrumental and emotional support for people returning to an educational environment so that they can increase the chances of getting an education, build hope for a better future. What do we know about mutual help? There's a lot of it about, right? Uh, AEA started in the 1930s, um, uh, and a slew of other 12-step uh, organizations which have come about as other drug epidemics have come along, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Methamphetamine Anonymous, Marijuana Anonymous, also newer groups, uh, cognitive behaviorally uh, based groups like Rational Recovery, Smart Recovery, uh, a life Ring Secular Organization, Women for Sobriety, and so on. There's a lot of uh, resources around. Um, by far the biggest uh, is AA, of course. That's been around the longest. Uh, there's about 1.5 to 2 million uh, members in AA and NA in the United States. So there's a very high density uh, recovery resource in most communities. Um, now, uh, this has been studied now extensively, the strong support now for uh, AA as um, a, a, a recovery support intervention and also interventions, clinically uh, delivered interventions, um, uh, to support linkage to AA. These are called 12-step facilitation interventions. And these have there have been about a dozen trials now, randomized controlled trials, uh, uh, showing support for 12-step facilitation, which is a clinically delivered treatment to engage people in AA. Um, and it turns out that uh, these treatments uh, that link patients to AA do as well, if not better. They do certainly do better in terms of uh, long-term remission. Um, uh, in, 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 in uh, enhancing uh, substance use outcomes and linking patients to uh, community groups. Now, 12-step uh, facilitation is not AA, but when we do the mechanism study to understand, well, why is it that patients in 12-step facilitation are doing better? It's because of their involvement in AA. So we can discern that from using mechanisms uh, type studies. The other thing that we've learned about AA, and I think by extension we can extrapolate to other mutual help groups, perhaps with the ex exception of spirituality, is that, because we, which is more specific to 12-step, but the way that mutual health groups confer benefit, these are the empirically supported mechanisms of behavior change through which AA works. By changing people's social network, as I alluded to, by boosting people's coping and confidence in their ability to cope with high-risk situations while staying abstinent, by helping to re-motivate people over time, by reducing craving and impulsivity, and uh, these are some of the ways that we found. I mentioned about remission, 12-step facilitation, and AA involvement is associated with much higher rates of continuous remission. In this study, a randomized controlled trial, it was found that those engaged in 12-step facilitation treatment had 71% more cases, 71% more cases in full sustained remission at the end of one year relative to cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. The other thing that's important when we're thinking about Addressing an endemic, high volume, high burden disease like substance use disorder is cost, right? We don't have infinite amounts of money to spend on, there's lots of competing diseases which need attention also, but certainly this one is uh, the top public health problem. Turns out that when we link patients to indigenous community resources, in this case, NA and AA in the community, not only does it produce better outcomes, about one third more likely to be abstinent at one and two years, but it reduces reliance on the healthcare system because people are not going to the emergency room, they're not taking up hospital beds. They're actually not using professional resources that they actually can get from NA and AA. And in this study in the VA, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they found that patients linked to AA and NA in the community <coughs> had $8,000 less uh, healthcare costs over a two year period relative to those coming from uh, programs, CBT programs. So, uh, that translates across those patients to about 10 or $15 million in savings, okay, just across those 10 programs that were in this study in terms of healthcare costs. So that's uh, good news. Now, <clears throat> given my time here, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, uh, spend too much time on, on, I was gonna talk to you about uh, young adults in particular, uh, but I, I haven't got time. <laughs> so, uh, but I do wanna mention some of the other science on uh, other recovery support services. Um, we found some interesting things with young adults also. I thought I'd, I'd tell you a little bit about that given the, um, the focus here uh, at, at VCU. Um, but mutual health groups, let me just t tell you in a nutshell, mutual health groups, uh, people, young adults benefit as much as older adults in terms of participation in mutual health groups like AA and NA, but the way they benefit differ. 
Okay, I'll be happy to answer the questions on that or send you papers on, on that. We've found some very interesting things there. But I want to kind of talk about other kinds of recovery support services. As I mentioned, uh, recovery support services have been formalized based on the evidence from peer support coming from 12-step groups, like this idea of a sponsor, somebody who's a mentor that you're in contact with every day that provides monitoring and supervision. This helps people stay on track. We know this from all kinds of other health behavior change also, having a, um, a, a, you know, a uh, fitness coach, for example. So this has been formalized in recovery coaching models all around the country. We don't have a lot of data yet on these. These are being studies. We, we've adopted this model at Massachusetts General Hospital where I work because it helps people stay well. Okay? With accountable care, there's an incentive now not just to treat people and get them off your seat and treat the next one, get that one and treat them. It's rather, how do I keep this person well? Okay. So this shift in emphasis to wellness as opposed to just treating deficits has resulted in uh, the adoption of these recovery coaching models. Sober living environments, there's some good studies now just show how powerful sober living environments are. Okay. In this study, this is a randomized controlled trial where they randomized patients to treatment as usual, which was uh, aftercare as usual, versus uh, living in a sober living environment. What they found was that half as many individuals using substance, were using substances across a two-year follow-up period, 50% more likely to be employed, and one-third lower incarceration uh, rates uh, for those in the sober living versus um, uh, standard outpatient care where they were just living where they wanted to live. Okay? Uh, when they looked at the cost-effectiveness uh, analyses, they found this was saving society about $30,000 over this two-year period per patient. Okay. So not only was it more effective, but it was very cost effective also. What about clinically? We have been kind of slow on the uptake of treating addiction like a chronic illness. It's, it's really the, the peers in the community have done a, a, a better job in terms of implementing these things rather than clinic. But now we've started to actually look at this clinically. This is one study by Michael Dennis and colleagues in Illinois. I think it's a very compelling study. What he did, he randomized patients to receive kind of chronic disease management or recovery management versus treatment as usual. And the, uh, every quarter, as you might treat hypertension or diabetes, every quarter they were asked to meet with a uh, clinician uh, who did an assessment, gave them uh, feedback or not, and encouraged them to, um, to get back into treatment if they needed it. So half the patients were assigned to this recovery management checkup where they were given the assessment and feedback, and if they were doing poorly, they were encouraged to get back into treatment. The other half had treatment as usual and then just had the assessment without the feedback or the conversation. So they followed them up for four years. What did they find? The people who got the conversation every quarter, okay, in addition to the feedback, got back into treatment if they needed it three years earlier than people who got the conversation but without, didn't get the conversation, just got the feedback. Okay. Three years, it's only a four year study, so they got back into treatment three years earlier. In fact, the only, um, the only variable which predicted re entry into treatment for those who needed it, out of 18 variables that they looked at, the only one that predicted re entry was whether they got the recovery management checkup or not. So, what does this say? It says that we, having a low intensity, high extensity, type of intervention, a chronic disease management model, can help people get back into treatment. They do better if they do, and it's actually cost effective as well. They did a cost effectiveness analysis. Recovery community centers, these are growing all over the country. This is an older map now. This is probably, probably about 50% higher now in terms of uh, recovery community centers. We're doing this up in the northeast here. You can see there's a big kind of uh, amalgamation of these. That's where we're doing a study right now to look at these. Um, but uh, what we're finding is high utilization of these centers, anywhere from you know hundreds to thousands. I mean, the one in Providence has about six to ten thousand visits a month. Okay, in this recovery community center, in educational settings, uh, there are now studies. We've just submitted a big study. Um, uh, looking at recovery high schools um, in Massachusetts and Texas, Tennessee, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, to look at the effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and best practices in recovery high schools. They're showing uh, very good benefits, roughly reducing relapse risk by half. And in collegiate recovery programs, again, providing indigenous recovery support in high-risk environments. 
So we know that college settings tend to be high-risk environments for heavy drinking, and providing a visible, locatable resource in the communities, in these communities, uh, uh, tends to uh, be associated with uh, low, uh, again, these are not comparative uh, trials, they're not randomized trials, but within subjects, within individuals who uh, re-engage in college life, um, who have had a substance use disorder, the relapse rates in these uh, settings are very low. High risk settings, but very low relapse rates. Um, about anywhere from 4 to 12% per year, okay? So that's much lower than what would be expected in this early stage and phases of recovery. I want to end just by highlighting a couple of um, uh, recovery, innovative recovery support structures and resources. One is called Phoenix Multisport, which is essentially, again, from a behavioral economic standpoint, providing alternative competing rewards that can compete with drug use. In this case, exercise. Scott Strobe, who started Phoenix, um, was a guy who started exercising and got into this social network of exercise and activity as a way to compete and promote uh, recovery. And then there's online resources. Uh, this is about 500,000 people on this website in the rooms that can provide recovery support. Also for families, um, there's been a, uh, because of the opioid epidemic, there's been a growth in family support for uh, family members affected by opioid addiction. One is, in, started in Massachusetts, is Learn to Cope, learntocope.org. Um, and of course, Alanon and Aranon have been around for a long time. So um, I want to stop there because I don't want to take up uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Brewer's uh, time. But thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully, we'll have time for questions. Please.